Shalom, everyone. If you're new here to my community, I want to start off by saying welcome. My name is AJ, and I'm your host on my new podcast, Between Two Worlds. Let's just jump right in. Why am I doing this? That's the first question I'm asked every single time I mention partaking in social media or even mentioning the fact that I want to start a podcast or that I'm preparing to start a podcast. Well, truth be told, it's because I don't see my viewpoint as often and as much as I'd like in the West here. I feel like it's very difficult to find someone who I can relate to, especially being that, you know, I'm a young 21-year-old girl that goes to college, spends most of her time either at college or studying or working. So I just want to take some time and share my journey and the knowledge that I've acquired through the struggles I've been through and the journey that I've been going through for the past three years with Islam. On top of that, I love, love talking in general, but also about Islam. So essentially, I just want to create a space where anyone from any place in the world can just tune in and find a community, find a space where they feel represented. I feel like now it's very hard to find that. And I just want to find that space here in the technological world where even if we don't know each other in real life, even if you don't know what I look like, even if we've never spoken before through these episodes and these one hour long voice memos, we can find some solace, we can find a community, we can find a space that we can call home. So yeah, now I do want to touch base on the podcast name and why I decided after months and months to finally choose one and the meaning behind it. As I'm sure you can see by the cover art, the title is Between Two Worlds. And essentially, when I was choosing the name, it was really difficult because I had quite a few ideas in mind. And because I started recording for this podcast, I would say, about six months ago. I was a 20 year old at that time. It was before my birthday. And I just had fallen into this dark hole where I wasn't connected with Islam as much as I had been in the past. And I just felt myself spiraling and going back into these old habits. And I love talking about Islam, like I mentioned. So I just figured instead of me just talking to myself and helping myself, I could record my journey, record how I feel, and release it to the world. And hopefully it'll find a community where people feel the same way, go through the same ups and downs, and it'll be able to help not just myself, but also other people. So yeah, that's kind of the backstory of when I started recording for this. And back then I had a different name. But then after like going back and forth with it, I just realized that the name that I had chosen at the time didn't have sort of like a double meaning to it. It didn't, it didn't feel special to me. It didn't feel right to me, which is why I had never posted anything, which is why all I did was keep the edited episodes on my laptop. And now with Between Two Worlds, obviously, it's kind of just talking about this dunya and the akhira and how right now the time and space that we live in is kind of just a midpoint, you know? We're like in a waiting phase. We're between this world and the next. And when I say we're between this world, you're probably like, what do you mean we're between this world? We're obviously in the dunya, right? But the thing is, Islamically, I feel like a lot of people fail to recognize that we're not meant to be a part of this dunya. We're not meant to put down our roots in this dunya and start building here. And that's why I chose between these two worlds, because we're not grounded to the dunya. We're just floating 
around it, you know, trying to find our way to the Akhirah, to the right place, to our final destination. And that's why I decided to have that as the name between two worlds. To me, I feel like at the surface level, it's like, okay, mm, cute name, cute slogan. And then when you actually open it up and you dissect it, you see there's a bigger meaning to it. Anyways, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of insight into my logic and the way I went about choosing the name. Now, moving on to the most awaited part, I feel like, not really, but let's talk about me. So, my name is Aisha, and like I said before, I'm a 21-year-old college girl. I'm studying cell and molecular biology, and I'm getting a minor in law. I live in the West. I'm just a girl from America's Big Apple, as many people like to call a city, but I just call it home or New York. You guys can call me AJ, not Aisha, because we're besties now, and my besties get to call me AJ. I'm Afghan, so unfortunately, I don't speak Arabic. My home language is Pashto. It's one of the two largest languages in the country. More on the note that I don't speak Arabic, I'm going to tell you kind of a little funny story about this one time where I was, like I was saying before, I think I've said it like probably two or three times by now, but I love, love talking about Islam. So I was just, you know, talking to one of my friends that I had just recently met from uni, and I was talking about how Recently, I had just been on a journey with Islam and I just felt so much more closer to Allah. And the girl that I was talking to at the time was like, well, can you tell me more about like how you developed, you know, a close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what were the changes that you made and how did it feel and everything like that. So I was telling her stories about that and I was telling her about this one time where I was trying to catch this bus so that I could get to campus on time to take this really important exam that I had. The bus was just moving so slow because it was one of those intersections in New York where there's like multiple traffic lights and like a half block radius. It was just like an intersection where the bus was like crossing one corner, but then it was like a really short corner and then it was crossing another corner. But then in order to cross that corner, it was like a highway next to it. So it had to like stop there to allow the highway cars to come through. And then there was a turn after that. So then they had to wait again so we could turn the block. Basically, it was like all in all, I think three or four traffic lights that we had to wait for. And the bus that I needed to take was the last bus on that route until like the nighttime because that's just how some of the routes work. So yeah, I was trying to catch that bus and I literally could not catch it for the life of me. Like the bus was just moving so slow. And so I went up to the driver and I was telling the driver, like, I really needed to cut off. And he was like, no, I'm sorry. Like, I don't care if it's the last bus that's leaving right now. You have to wait until I get to the corner to the bus stop. So we got to the bus stop. I get off and I'm running like across the street, full speed, not looking like anywhere, just trying to get on that bus. That bus had already left the bus stop. It was moving towards the highway that I was telling you. So it was about to take the highway and go to the city. And I was like, I really need to catch the bus. So I don't know what came over me in that moment, but I just decided to run basically halfway onto the highway after the bus. And like these cars that were obviously because it's entering a highway, you have to go a certain speed so that you're matching the cars that are on the highway. So they were probably traveling like 30 miles an hour because obviously the speed limit on the highway is like 55. So entering it, it goes from 25 to 55. So obviously they're like accelerating really, really fast at that point to get to that speed that they need to, that the other cars are traveling at. And I'm just like running on foot. Y'all a lot. It was so scary. I don't know what came over me in that moment, but I ended up getting on the bus right but before I got on the bus obviously 
the light was green so the bus was getting onto the highway and all the other cars were behind it getting on the highway as well one of the cars was going really really fast and basically almost ran me over i don't know how but like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace i did not get run over that bus ended up stopping and that was just that one day where i had already been having like a really negative week and been having a really really hard time practicing and feeling close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and and that day I just was so thankful for being alive and not like getting hurt and it just helped me you know connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more from that point on Allah was telling this story to that girl I was explaining to her about how like the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it just became so clear to me in that moment and just over time with other experiences that I've had. And I accidentally said Tajween instead of Tawheed because I don't speak Arabic. So to me, I was like just so into the story, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, like it just helped make me believe and have so much more faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just being able to practice and show Tawheed. She was just so, like, confused. She stopped me. I was, like, obviously still talking because I was so into the story. And she just stopped me out of nowhere. And she's like, what What do you mean, tajweed? Because obviously tajweed means the recitation of Quran, like, the proper ways to say it and everything. Um, and tawheed means the oneness, the belief of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So very two distinct meanings. And she was so confused. She's like, wait, 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 what? And it was just so embarrassing. So, yeah, just wanted to put that out there. If in this podcast I do end up making a mistake like that, I'm so sorry. It's not on purpose. I'm just not a native Arab speaker. The words that I know are because of Islam, obviously, in my journey. It's still going on. I'm not perfect. I'm always going to mess up because I'm human. But yeah, just wanted to put that out there. And now... Jumping into today's section of the podcast, because I feel like there is no more introduction things to say, really. So let's just jump right in. I know I kind of touched based on why I'm doing this and the whole viewpoint aspect of it, but I don't remember if I really tuned into social media and how important it is. And honestly, if, he, if I did already, I'm just going to repeat myself because, like I said, I love talking. And this particular subject is very important. And I think even if I am saying it again, it's still worth mentioning because it's just that important. So let's talk about social media and its purpose, right? Obviously, the whole point of social media is to connect with other people, to, you know, build a community. But honestly, I feel like over the years, and we've definitely seen this very, like, gradually, I would say, but especially now, I think more people are waking up and realizing that the purpose that social media truly had from day one has become so different from what it is now. Like, its original purpose and what it's being used for right now are two very, very distinct things. And a lot of people aren't liking how it is now. And the reason I say this is because there's actually like this social media app. I think it's called Moment that's being made currently so that people can use social media for its true purpose, which was to document life and to connect with people that are abroad, like your family, and to just share your memories, share, you know, certain things with certain people. Now, I feel like it's become like a competition to see who's the most popular, who's the most prettiest, who owns the most things, who can get the most attention, the most likes, right? Everyone just craves attention now because of social media. And it's just really, really sad because, I mean, as we know from Islam, one of the greatest struggles for Muslims is attention, right? Because human nature for Muslims is they want to be seen, right? Like human nature for all women, all the time, is always going to be to be seen, right? They want to be admired. They want to be seen. And that is why Islam recognizes 
that that is the biggest struggle, right? Covering up, wearing hijab, not being seen, being, you know, modest. All of those are part of the reason why Muslims struggle so much in the recent day and age, right? And social media feeds into that on a whole other level. Now, it's not just, okay, the small community around you, your school, your friends, how much they like you. Now, it opens up the floor to thousands and millions of people all around the globe, especially if you have a public profile. So easy for someone to just go on your account, look at your photos, judge you. Mm, Maybe they'll follow you. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll share your photo to their friends. And you're just now able to, one, get so much more attention. And two, you're able, like, if you're trying to practice Islam, and fight that urge to be seen it just becomes so much more of a struggle because now it's like okay it's fine in real life I'll cover I'll be you know modest and and I will not speak to the other gender and you know I'll keep that aloneness I would say in check and I'll make sure that I'm doing that right but then when it comes to the online platform it just becomes so much more difficult people don't realize how it's also necessary to keep that same quote-unquote halal gap online as well. And like I said before, because you are opening yourself up to such a wider audience, it's no longer just a small group of people, the community around you, your city members that are seeing you. It's now also tens of thousands of people who have access to see you, right? And I think social media, because of that, whole aspect is just very very iffy for for muslims to use especially those who are struggling and not practicing it just it's a scary environment i feel like especially the way i see it as it, it's scary you put yourself out there and, and now it's no longer just like i said like i've said like ten thousand times now it's no longer just a small community of people that'll see you uncovered or, you know, they'll see you maybe doing something that Islamically you're not supposed to do. Now it's it's so many more people. It's it's normalizing these sins. It's normalizing incorrect hijab. It's normalizing all of these different aspects of society that weren't going to be as normalized in our local communities as it is now. Right. And I know all of that probably sounds like very overwhelming and oh, my God, social media is bad. Social media is this and that. That's I don't want that to be what's coming across. Honestly, that's not the whole point. I'm just stating some basics because I feel like we all need to recognize that these are truths that are evident across the board. Irregardless, if you're Muslim or not, social media makes people want to be seen want to have a large following want to put themselves out there for example there's a lot of like young children who are 12 13 years old who would never in a million years leave the house in shorts and a tank top or shorts and a crop top right they just don't feel comfortable doing it but because they're at home and wearing it right they take a photo because they're home they're comfortable doing that And then they upload that photo to Instagram. And now, even though they would never wear it in public, they took a photo in it at home. And now there's thousands of people, hundreds of people, dozens of people who have access to that photo, right? They no longer have like a distinction between, okay, what the online world is and what reality is, right? Because obviously there is that distinction of, I feel comfortable in this in the house, And I don't feel comfortable with this in the house. But in social media, there's not that distinction because what you upload is for everyone to see. What you upload is there for everyone to see, regardless of whether you'd feel comfortable showing it to that person or not. It's going to be there for them to see. Like I said, unless you have a private account, which most of us don't. And then more on the other side, because I know I was talking about Muslims and girls a lot, but let's also talk about for guys. The biggest trouble for a man in Islam is recognized to be to lowering their gaze, right? And the reason of that is because men in their nature, 
as humans, they have that nature to look at someone. They like to admire things. They like to have eye candy, you know, it's just human nature for them. And so social media, again, makes it so easy for them to have access to these things, especially, like I said, both of these go hand in hand, right? Because, okay, a woman's biggest struggle is to be admired. And, you know, she feels comfortable in what she's wearing at home. She feels pretty. She takes a photo. Where is she going to upload it online so that she can be admired? And then same thing with the guy. Oh, he wants eye candy. He is attracted to, you know, this type of um, person. So he's going to go online, go look for it. He's going to find it and he's going to stare at her, like it, comment, whatever. All these things. It just social media's purpose from what it was supposed to be in the beginning has deviated so much. Now it's like I said, just a competition. It's a way for people to indulge in their human nature. Um, and it becomes dangerous when you put into account Islam, right? It's it's honestly a distraction for a lot of us. Um, irregardless of that whole gender issue, it just eats away so much time. We're just on TikTok or on Instagram Reels, just mindlessly scrolling. Or now even YouTube Shorts. I know my little brother, all he does is go on his iPad when he comes home and just mindlessly scroll on YouTube Shorts. There's just so much information, so many people out there for everyone to interact with. It's overwhelming for your brain, honestly, especially when you take into account that you know our brain can honestly only handle so much information at once obviously we have a capacity and what happens when you first wake up and your brain has not even reached half of its capacity and the first thing that you do is grab your phone and you're mindlessly scrolling on there right one video comes up okay you probably watch it maybe five seconds next video comes up maybe you watch it two seconds you didn't really like it the next video comes up okay on tiktok Um, I think the longest video now is uh, three minutes, okay? But no one really uses three minutes. Everyone typically uses like one minute or less, right? So let's say you have a one minute video. Even then you watch one minute of a video, right? And then you scroll again. How much content is being thrown at your brain in the span of like the first 10 minutes of you waking up? Too much for your brain to handle. And that just has so many negative side effects on your brain all of that and then also going back to what I was talking about before like we don't realize how much social media has an effect on us for example right me mindlessly scrolling on TikTok I'm seeing like you know thousands of sounds thousands of videos trends everything like this dances pop up and I'm obviously my brain has a certain capacity right where it's not going to keep certain things but the ones that like spike the most dopamine in my body are automatically going to be the ones that my brain categorizes as the most important and when it does that it's going to be remembered by my brain right because oh this type of content or this type of sound this type of image sparks this much dopamine in Aisha's brain therefore this is good because the body likes dopamine so mm, we're going to favorite that. And every single time, it's going to become more and more prominent. It's going to take a larger space in my brain. So let's say there's a sound. That audio that goes like, what's up, Riri? <laughs> what's up, Rocky? Right? For example, that one, right? Let's say that one sparks dopamine in my brain, right? And it has like that music in the background or whatever, right? Now, my brain is associating ooh, whatever interaction that was and that music, a part of it as like dopamine and now every single time I see it my brain is going to be more inclined to watch it to like it to stick around with it right so then let's say that I keep seeing videos like that or music like that on my page right like not consistently but I'm seeing it like every once in a while the reason why it's going to start popping up on my feed more and more is because now my brain favored it at once so now every single time I see it my brain is going to be like okay wait stop let's fully watch this because remember that time when Aisha watched this 
and she actually liked it and it sparked dopamine, okay, it's here again. Let's do it again. It's going to spark dopamine again. And it's just going to keep going and going and going to the point where my whole entire phone, my whole social media is going to be saturated with this one type of music, with this one type of a content and that's the same thing with like social media algorithms that's how it works too the more you watch something the more you like it it's marked as like okay she likes this more same thing like kind of quote-unquote dopamine in social media terms where it's like okay in the marketing side in the algorithm side they're like okay she likes this and so we're gonna start pushing this type of content to her more and more and then let's say maybe I see this dance right because there's this dance going on right now I think it's like to the song by this this new artist I think she's South African and it's I think the song names like water or something like that that has like a very kind of explicit dance to it and then it gets viral and then it pops up my for you page and then I see it and the west and social media hand in hand it just promotes so much nakedness and so much explicitness that we don't recognize until we take a step back right for example, music, it just has such a large effect on us that so many people feel to recognize. Even me for the longest time. I stopped listening to music, I think for about almost a year. And it was so eye-opening. Instead of listening to music, I started to listen to Quran and listen to Nasheeds. And mentally, I was in such a good space. I could remember things so much better. My brain was no longer you know, storing song lyrics, but it was storing the nasheeds and storing Quran in my brain. Literally, instead of me playing um, like a song by A Boogie and me automatically knowing the lyrics or, or learning the lyrics so quickly, now it was Surah Maryam, my favorite surah, that I would play the same recitation and to the point where now I like memorize the first three minutes of the recitation because of how much I listened to it. And it was like so unintentional. Like I wasn't trying to do that, but it happened because that's how much these sounds and these musics and all these things have an effect on us. How much what we're exposed to has an effect on us. So yeah, that is kind of like the negative side of social media. And I don't know if I already mentioned it, but all of these things, it just, especially with how social media opens up such large platforms to us, there's so many bad deeds that can come with this. And we see that across the board. But you know what we haven't seen? What we haven't seen is the positive sides of this. How these social media platforms could be used to build great, beautiful communities. How these same trends where they're promoting music could be used to promote listening to Nasheeds or listening to Quran on the same algorithm. And guess what? If someone sticks around and likes this um, this Quran recitation that I posted or this other you know, uh, what to call it, nasheed that someone posted, it sparks a dopamine and it's also flagged in their algorithm. Now, instead of them getting uh, their feed saturated with, you know, music and, and explicit dances and whatnot, now their feed is going to be like, um, okay, well, Aisha liked this, you know, nasheed sound very, very much. And every single time it comes on her page, she watches it. It gives her dopamine. She enjoys it. Now that's going to be flagged instead. I feel like as the youth part of the Ummah and the fact that we all have so much access to social media, we should be using it to even for like our 100, you know, followers that we have. If we start posting these uh, Islamic contents more and more through social media, it's going to saturate even maybe two or three of your friends' pages and the algorithm will see that type of content and be like, okay, this person likes that. And now it's going to push that same content from more popular creators or public creators that have the same type of content that you just uploaded. And the only reason that that's going to be pushed onto their page is because you uploaded that. And that in turn that just opens up a whole new round of possibility of good deeds for yourself, for your friends, for every single person who likes that, for every single person who shares it. It's incredible the amount of things that we would be able to do if the youth used social media in a positive way. I feel like 
most of the time that I spent on this obviously was delving into the negatives of it and how it's horrible. But honestly, the reason it's like that is because we don't take advantage of it. We don't utilize it in a way that it would be beneficial to us Islamically and culturally and, and you know, all these other things. I mean, honestly, my mom, if she sees on my Instagram that I'm posting Islamic content, you know, instead of me in my little Afghan dress or or me lip singing to the new A Boogie sound that came out, right? She's going to be so much more glad, so much more happy seeing me post the, that Islamic content versus me posting the other thing. And that's across the board for our friends, for our family, for our community members, for anyone, even like strangers. Sometimes they'll come up to me and be like, oh, wow, that TikTok that you posted? Obviously not like strangers, strangers, but people that I know from my institutions that aren't Muslim that follow my content or will see it on their page. They'd be like, oh, yeah, actually, that that thing that you posted the other day about it, that's so interesting. Can you tell me more about it? And now it just opens a whole new realm of possibilities for them to ask me questions, for me to interact with someone new. You know, now it, they start picking their brain and start thinking about Islam or whatever it is at that point that I upload it. It's just there's so much good that we could do with social media, just like so much bad that we could do with social media. It all depends. These are the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in this day and age. It all depends your intention and how you use it, right? Because your niyyah is the most important thing, right? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, regardless, if you made the intention to pray Fajr on time, you set an alarm, you wanted to wake up, but you didn't wake up, guess what? It's fine. You set the intention, you're going to get the reward for praying it on time. All you have to do is, you know, pray kada. So yeah, it's just so cool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes into account your intention, how you're using these beautiful tools that he's provided us with. It's it's so much more than just black and white, right? The way a lot of people tend to make Islam, especially I would say the older generation, they love, love to make everything black and white. But the reality is Islam is not black and white. It can't be. There's so many things so many new nuances that have been created in this day and age that weren't around when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was alive and well, right? In his day and age, these things, this social media, these recordings, physical pictures, those weren't a thing, right? Like, that didn't exist. People, nowadays, people are concerned, okay, um, I have this video or this picture, digital picture of my loved one who passed away. Oh, what should I do with it? Uh, should I keep it? Should I delete it? What should I do? A lot of, um, you know, sheikhs are like, oh, yeah, that's actually bad. You should get rid of it. But then some people, they're like, no, no, it's okay. Like, keep it. Um, it doesn't really matter. Whatever, right? But the thing is, we can never be sure. You can't say this thing is um, good to do or this thing is bad to do because this wasn't around back then. We don't have no ruling from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or no advice from any of the prophets about how to handle these situations. The best thing that we could do is take into account what we've been told to do in the past and how we could apply it to the current scenarios, right? But there's no way for us to be 100% telling someone, okay, this is haram, when there is no ruling on it, when there's no hadiths about it, when it's just us applying the knowledge that we have been given in the past. Islam is not black and white, no matter how much we try to make it. It will never be black and white. There will always be a little gray area. There will always be that uncertainty because there's so much that we've been told in the Quran because the Quran is a way of life, right? All of these things that, that have been given to us in the Quran, it's all a, supposed to be a guide into how you live your life. It never ever is going to delve into each and every single detail of Okay, um, you're praying five times a day. Okay, you must put your hands like this. You must put your feet like this. Your body must be doing this. You must be thinking of this, right? Because, I mean, at least in my culture, um, I come from Afghanistan, like I mentioned. Like, I've been told growing up, okay, you have to put your feet this way while you pray. You have to do this with your hands. A lot of Arabs are told, okay, they have to raise their finger when they're sitting down, citing 
Y'all, I had to Google it. It's called a tasha, tashahad. Um, like I said, I'm not Arab, so I just um knew it based on like the dua's name that like I was told, which is this um atahiyat dua. So I wasn't sure. I had to Google it, but yeah, like they're told that it's the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, a confirmed sunnah where they raise their index fin- finger while saying Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Right during that time, they raise their finger and then they lower it. But that's also like, like I said before, not black and white because it was confirmed that you raise the index finger, but it was never confirmed when to do it. It was just, you know, a, um, a sunnah that was documented. And we can't even be really sure if that sunnah was documented correctly or not because it's a whole thing where like hadiths have levels to it and you know it's just it becomes so much more than just black and white that's basically the whole point of what i'm saying it's not saying okay this is 100 percent correct and this is 100 percent wrong especially when you don't have any real evidence or any real saying that you can completely say is 100 percent true to back it up you know like the only thing that we can 100 percent say black and white is true is anything that's written in the quran right other than that, we as the Ummah have to recognize that there are black and white spaces in Islam and that's okay. And that when non-Muslims or other people or even Muslims come up to you, you should not hesitate to give an answer. But you should also hesitate to say, this is 100% like this, this is 100% like that. And that's why um, there's so many stories that I was told growing up about certain um really famous or really well-known sheikhs or imams who were told or asked questions hundreds of times and they would never ever give a solid answer they would never say 100 percent yes 100 percent no they would just give their advice and say but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and that is what we need to do as a Muslim ummah is to recognize that there's black and white spaces anyways I feel like I got off topic I don't remember exactly what was the first point of me bringing that up But yeah, essentially, there's just so much more that goes into Islam that we need to take into account before we even think about saying, oh, this is wrong, this is right. But at the same time, there's so much more that we could do as the youth, as part of this new generation that would help grow Islam, help us gain Jannah, right? Because it's so, like I keep mentioning, it's just so easy nowadays to gain Jannah, right? And the reason I say that is because social media opens up the floor to thousands of millions of people. And what you do with that platform, what you do with that opportunity, it could lead you to Jahannam. Astaghfirullah, may none of us ever reach that level, but it could also lead you to Jannah, a lifetime of paradise, right? And it's the smallest actions, which is why each and every single day, the youth, we all need to recognize that. And it's not making a 180% turn, you know, which a lot of us try to do in the youth. It's like, either we're going to do it full blown or not going to do it at all. That's not how it should be. The goal of Islam, the goal of each and every single one of us in the back of our minds should be, let me try to be 1% better each and every single day. That is the I'm going to go into this on a whole other level, another episode on, you know, why I wore hijab and how I came across doing that. But to sum it up, like just a little portion of it is one of the biggest reasons why I wore hijab is because it is a way to prove and show to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm trying to better myself, right? Because even some days, like I might not be doing it 100% correctly, But if I'm trying each and every single day in some aspect to make myself better, that is proof enough in itself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That I am actively working towards being better. I'm never, ever still, I might be taking a step backward in one spot, but as long as I'm taking a step forward in one spot, it's fine. It is 100% A-OK, right? It's just so, like... I feel like nuanced in this day and age for people to say, okay, um, 
I'm trying to be 1% better in this area today, but then, okay, I messed up this next day on this area, but it's okay because I'm taking a step forward in this other area, right? I feel like that's not how people see it. They see it as, okay, I'm either going to go 100% or I'm going to go 0%. It's like, hello, Islam isn't about that. You cannot, no matter how many times people try to say that they can, you cannot do a one complete 180 without time if you want it to be permanent, right? The whole point is that, okay, one day I was not a practicing Muslim and then I woke up and I said, you know what? I want to learn about my my religion more. So I went on YouTube and I watched something. And then the next day, okay, I watched something on YouTube. Now I'm going to read a page of Quran. And every single day I was trying and I was doing something more and more and more and more and more to the point where now it just became, certain things just became part of my habits and other things, it's just things that I'm adding on to it, right? It's not like one day I woke up not practicing Islam, and the next day I threw on a hijab and I decided to start this podcast and I decided to share and take advantage of social media. No, uh -uh. I wish it was like that. I wish it was that easy. I wish I didn't struggle with it. I wish I didn't go through days and months and years of feeling, you know, I'm not worthy of this or, or I'm doing something wrong because so many people that I knew that were older than me, my friends, community members my elders who you know aren't part of this generation would be like uh don't you think you're doing something wrong you know or even in our day and age the haram police on tiktok and on on social media they they come after people's necks when they're trying to wear hijab or they're trying to be more modest right it's like what was it uh being a part-time hijabi like hello would you say that part-time praying is wrong like that oh um because you don't pray all five because I don't pray fajr on time every single day that means I should just never pray like what I think it just the the black and whiteness and and the lack of understanding is unreal right it's like that's the same thing as hijab like just because I'm not doing it all the time doesn't mean I shouldn't do it at, at all it's better to do good deeds sometimes and to never do them. It's better to, you know, do bad deeds sometimes instead of doing them all the time. It's that type of mindset that we need to adopt. It's that type of mindset that we need to take into account. That no, no, I'm not doing anything wrong just because I'm trying and I'm not doing it all the time. I'm doing something right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be so proud of me, so happy for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to know, you know, that I'm trying each and every single day to fulfill his commands, to fulfill all uh, the teachings that were sent down to us to to be a better person, to follow the life the way that the Quran tells us to. Because like I said before, the Quran isn't a, a rule book. It's a way of life. It's it's a it's a way of living and the best way of living, right? And me making that little effort every single day is just proving that I'm making an active effort to live the lifestyle that my creator wants me to live. It's just so, you know, eye-opening when you take it into account like that. And I just hope that if you take anything from today, it's that we need to be more involved in social media in a better positive way and that we cannot be afraid of making mistakes or of not doing something all the time so we're not going to do it at all that cannot be what the new generation does the new generation has to have the iman and and the strength to even in the face of people talking bad about you saying that oh you're doing something wrong you're going to keep doing it because you know it's correct i know it's correct allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it's correct and that is what truly matters that's what we need to do. But anyways, I'm kind of getting very, very heated <laughs> with this discussion. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's all that I want for the major notes for this podcast episode to be for us to all take that and ponder with it 
and to to utilize that please if you're listening to this right now if you're still here take out your phone take out your laptop and find one islamic video or maybe one dua one um page of quran that you really like or or recitation link and achieve anything one thing to do with islam copy it and download it and upload it to at least one of your social media pages do that right now and make the active effort to do that at least once a week aim to do it every single day you know keep it in the back of your mind oh yeah okay uh today i haven't posted anything in regards to my religion so i'm gonna take five seconds five minutes to go on social media find something that i like about islam or having to do with the religion or having to do with islam in a positive way and upload it to my feed right upload it to my stories upload it somewhere so that my community the people around me can have access to it and inshallah may that one action that you take either today or every single day going forward each and every small action like that that you take may that be a means for us all to enter jannah amin ya rabbal alamin this is the way that we can make a change in our social media pages and how we the youth can take power and how we can earn ourselves a spot in Jannah inshallah in the eternal paradise this is a small small thing that we can all do that will just open a whole line of sadaqah for us a whole line of goodness you know that that is untouchable but that the old generations those who have passed do not have access to that the the people of the prophet's time did not have access to so long anyways um that is all i'm going to say for today i know i said that earlier too but please like i said take that one action take that time and do that take it and try to incorporate it into your day-to-day life more on the podcast note though because i do want to wrap it up i'm nearing an hour And I want this first episode to be under an hour. So hopefully stop talking so much. I'll be able to keep this under an hour. Um, But like I said, on the podcast front, I just want to talk a little bit about the episode schedule. So like I mentioned before, um, I am unfortunately a full-time college student. And on top of that, I'm majoring in a STEM subject and I'm minoring in law. So I don't really have as much time as I would like to have for my downtime and for using this podcast and for creating episodes and for crafting things. But I do know that I can commit to uploading at least once a month. Hopefully, inshallah, I'll be able to, you know, create a better schedule going forward where I am able to post more often. But for right now, starting off, I'm going to go ahead and commit to at least once a month. So make sure you tune in. Um, I also really, really want to incorporate an advice section for this podcast. So if you are interested in being a part of that, inshallah, the at on Instagram and TikTok is going to be podcast B to the number W. And I'll make sure to put that in the description as well. And inshallah, we'll have that section up and running um, very soon. Once we have built a larger community, inshallah, well, I'll be able to implement that. But for now, just make sure that you guys tune in on there for updates, for when the next episode is coming out, for all the juicy behind the scene details and everything. So yeah. Anyways, that now brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so, so much for listening to Between Two Worlds. I'm your host, AJ, and I'll catch you in the next one. Salam.